Hi there, my name is April Lee with um, Chronically Me on Instagram, and right now you're on Hope, Faith, and Thriving. This is my interview podcast. I found this amazing woman. Her name is Dana Rutherford. She's on Instagram. Um, um, on there, it says the trauma survive the trauma survivor's guide to life abundantly. Um, she deals with all types of things. She's been through a lot in her life, and she has an amazing story to share with you. There is so much about her that. Um, is inspiring and encouraging and um, just she has an amazing life and God has done a lot in her life and she has a lot to share and I really wanted to um, have everyone that I can find to get to know her get to her channel and um, see what she has to offer you because she's been through a lot she does a lot and she's an amazing woman of God and she has a lot to offer you she really does so here she is um, thank you so much for coming on here and being willing to talk to me and share whatever you want to share today. Um, I'm going to open it up for you to just kind of um, tell everyone who you are and what you're all about and what you're trying to do with all of your online things that you're doing and what you're trying to do in your life in general and then to help other people. Well, thank you, first of all, for that very kind introduction. That was very sweet. Um, so my name is Dana Rutherford, as April said, and I am really just about the day-to-day -day life after trauma. I feel like it's something that is not touched upon. We often hear about the crisis, but we often don't hear about uh, the day-to-day -day life that we live after trauma when you're still in survival mode after the crisis is over and you're living like you're still in it and you're not living the abundant life that God called us to live. And, um, so, I mean, did you want me to go ahead and get into my story? Cause yeah, it's a, yeah. Let's, it's a long, let's hear it's a long story, but I can, you know, kind of keep it as cut down as possible. Yeah. <laughs> so I, uh, I was born into a family of five. So I was one of three kids and I was the middle child and, um, my family was awesome and everything was great. But unfortunately, because my dad broke his back when I was in the womb, he had the doctors prescribed him a lot of prescription drugs at the time. It was not known back then, or, or they weren't saying that they were addictive. They were telling them that they were fine. And so my, my, you know, my parents both hurt their backs and they both trusted the doctors. And so they ended up becoming addicted to them. And with addiction, it's a horrible thing for a child to see because there's a lot of instability and you learn to be loyal to the people, even though they're doing things that may not be, you know, healthy for them. But you also can see that good people can turn to bad things because I try to emphasize that just because someone's an addict doesn't mean they're not a great person. They're not smart. They're not all these things. It's just unfortunate. But um, in that, I just learned to be basically grown up too fast. I took care. I became, you know, more of the nurturer, very much codependent, putting myself aside, making sure everybody else, you know, I could feel the energy in the room. I'm an empath. And if something was off, I felt, you know, I needed to do something to fix it. And, um, through that time, you know, I really just longed to be nurtured deep down. And I feel like, uh, that really just started my journey onto trying to figure out, sorry, my husband's coming in the door. I didn't want it to, I don't know if you're cutting this at all. It's okay. okay. No, I might or might not. It's okay. Just Okay. Um, thank you. So in that I, you know, just learned to become codependent and I, but I longed to be nurtured. And so I ended up going to church camp because one thing that I did do through the years is I was very close to my grandmother who took me to church. And so I knew from a young age that God had a plan for me and, you know, God loved me. And even my parents told me one time, you know, we love your brother and sister, but we knew there was something different about you. And I just kept that in my heart and in my mind. And, um, so I went to church camp and I met a boy there and he was 16. I was 15 and we became friends and he was a foster kid and I was, you know, the drug addict's daughter. So it felt like we were, you know, understanding of each other's situations. But in that, I always thought, okay, but he has it worse than me. He's mm -hmm. he, I need to probably figure out how to help him. And so once again, I put all my stuff aside and I wanted to be the best, what became a girlfriend to him. 
And there was a lot of red flags in the beginning and I just ignored them. I, I gaslit myself basically into believing that, you know, oh, well, you know, he just has a lot of issues and you need to be more considerate of his issues. And so, um, when I turned 18, I was like, you know, I want to move out. I want to get out of this life with my family because both my brother and sister became addicted too. And it was just, wow. it was chaos and I wanted out. I wanted this happily ever after that they tell you about that's really not the case <laughs> and so it's like a, the disney lie that we all believe and i so we got married at 18 years old i was 18 he was 19 and i don't recommend that ever because you don't even know like my son's 15 right now and i'm like there's no way he'd be ready in three years to get married wow. and so um um after we got married so two and a half months after we got married my mom went to the hospital and I thought, okay, well, she's getting prescription drugs. That's what they do. They go to the hospital and the hospital will give them the drugs and that's that. And that's what they did often. But this time was different. They told us, they called and said her liver was shutting down. And within six days, she was dead. It was very, oh, like very unexpected. She was 44 years old, very young, but it was all the prescription drugs. They wreck your liver. And then you know, so I took in my dad and my little brother who was 17 into my apartment. And, you know, I didn't even grieve myself. I grieved more for my dad at that time because I was like, he was just so pitiful that he lost his wife. And, you know, he really tried to get better at the end because we did have a conversation like, you know, hey, I, I really need you as my dad to like be there. But uh, three weeks after my mom died, I decided to get out of the house, go to the mall because I had just been engulfed in grief. And even though I wasn't grieving, I had to grieve for everybody else and let them all grieve. And so I just needed some time to myself. And when I came back, um, my dad, I went to check on him and he was dead. He, he died on my couch. So oh my it was like a weird I don't even know how to explain it. I was in such shock. We literally were, it was like going through the same thing three weeks later. So by that time I was just like, I, I didn't even know how to comprehend it. And so, um, you know, I got married and then bam, both my parents are dead. And then, you know, we're taking care of my little brother who's 17. Well, I didn't realize how bad his addictions were because he was now, he was now using to, you know, cope with the grief of losing. He was very close to my mother, like was diagnosed with separation anxiety. So when my mother died, it was just a horrible situation for him. And he was using and him and my uh, then husband decided to do drugs together. And I had no idea. And so um, eight months after my parents died, I found out that my husband was having a full affair, uh, was sleeping with a girl that he did drugs with and just left with her and went to Pensacola, which is seven hours away from me mm -hmm. and left me. This was the first time I was homeless, left me to just deal with everything. I had no money. I had nothing, you know? And so I was bouncing around friends, houses and couches until I got kicked out. And I was just lost. I had, you know, no thought of myself other than to just survive. I didn't know how to be a woman. I was thrown into womanhood at a young age and with that, your self-esteem plummets. And eventually he came back around and wanted me back and, you know, all that good stuff. And I, I didn't want to get back with him, but at the same time, I was so shot with my self-esteem and I lost everybody. My brother and sister went off to rehab or, you know, whatever they were doing. And so it, the thought of having at least somebody there, you know, it lured me back into to getting back with my then husband. And the sad part was, is that, you know, I didn't have the self-esteem back then to be like, no, like you, mm -hmm. what you did to me, I waited till marriage to, to have sex with him. Mm -hmm. And he robbed me of that in a matter of eight months when he had an affair, you know? So, but I just, I needed somebody to be there. And so, you know, things through the next years would feel like they were getting better. And then now I can see looking back, it was always like, if it was really good, it was because he was making up for something bad, or if it was mm -hmm. really good, it, it didn't last long. Um, but in that we had three boys who realistically, I think saved my life. They taught me love. I never knew existed. And, um, 
I mean, I just, I can't even express the magnitude of love I have for those boys and, uh, just God revealing himself more to me. Like imagine how much more I love you. The fact that you love them so much. And it just really, for the first time showed me love that didn't hurt every other bed of love hurt. People left, they died, they cheated on you, whatever. And this was the first time that I felt like an unconditional. Yeah. yeah. I like, have to say something. So yeah. as you're speaking, like, um, it is so, um, obvious, like the Lord had his hand, like right on you, like out of everyone in your family, not to say he wasn't with them, but when your mom had said that about you and like this calling and like what, like he, even though you were in all this, like I can see like his presence is ridiculously, <laughs> amazingly powerful in the, the way that you even made decisions and stuff. And then also as you're talking, like you literally had no time to process anything like it was one thing to the next this is crazy like i'm just in shock like i could sit here for five minutes just like processing what you just said to me um so that alone like if you're listening like that is that this is to me these are miracles these are miracles like what you're saying the fact that you can even say this and and be able to say it like i mean this is extreme thing these are extreme things and to be able to speak like this and talk like this and share like this and to do it in the way that you're doing it is a grace of God. Like <laughs> It is a grace of God. And I'm sure as you start speaking, people will see like how you were healed and how things, and how you're still probably in healing. And it's, it's amazing. Like you're so inspiring. I had no idea of any of this, obviously. <laughs> and I'm just like, I'm in awe of like God and like how amazing you are and what, how you've like, man, this is incredible like Thank what you've you overcome and you did a lot really young. Like that's yeah, all. And it's not and... me, it's God. I mean, I, I participated and I was willing, yeah. and I played, but it was God. I mean, yeah. Um, I sometimes just, I knew from a very young age, I just felt him and I could always feel yeah. him. And, and you know, that it just carried me through just mm -hmm. that feeling of, you know, and when I had my kids, it was like, I was something more to live for. You know, I needed to now be the one for them. Yeah. And, um, unfortunately my brother also overdosed from pills and died and, and he was only 24. And so six days after I had my second son, he passed and I was like, here we go again. You know, like I can't even enjoy a moment. And one of my family, and I just got angry because it was like, I wasn't angry at him. I was angry at my parents because I felt like he never got a good shake at life. He was the youngest. He, you know, was the only boy and, and he just was so depressed, you know? And so for me, he was, he, I was very motherly to him. And so it just hurt my heart. And, but the odd thing, and I get the God thing I should say is that my middle son looks exactly like my brother. So he was born, he died and they look identical and so God gave me that. But in those years, you know, it was just, I was a stay at home mom for a while. I homeschooled a little bit too. And it kind of made this environment that was easy to then abuse me because it was like, I had nobody, I had nowhere to go. I had no money. I had nothing, you know, other than my children. And so as the years progressed in my marriage, uh, you know, he, started to get more, he had, you know, more affairs and he started to not pay certain things. Like he was lying about money. And I realized he was using drugs again throughout pretty much throughout the whole marriage, but it was like in little spurts, but it was probably more than I ever even will know. Like there's probably more than I, that I don't know. And, um, so as it progressed toward when I turned about 32, mm -hmm he got extremely abusive and it was, it was like always psychological. It was always, you know, mental. He was very much about punishing in a mental way and mm -hmm. things like that. But the physical stuff was more, you know, punching holes in walls, breaking sentimental stuff of people that died in my life. Um, you know, even he even like grabbed me before, like yelled at me in my face, but as he got worse on drugs, when he was coming off of drugs, he started to become very abusive. Like wow. there was moments that I was scared he was going to kill me because he was very physically abusive. 
And so, you know, I started to fear not just for my safety, but for my kids, he never, he never hit them, but is I tried to always hide what he was doing, but there came a point that they could tell, you know, they knew. And so, um, when I turned 33, I was like, you know, God, what do you want from me? Cause I, what am I going to do? Like, I, I have nowhere to go. You know, I, I have these three kids that need me. Like I really felt like I was going to like lose everything. If I left this person, like he, I had, I couldn't breathe without him. Like, yeah. what was I going to do? And God said, there was a couple of things God said to me. Number one, he goes, uh, you think that you are, you know, you pride yourself on the fact that you're not an addict, like your family, but your addiction is codependency. And if you don't get out, you're going to die young, like your mom did. And I was like, wow, like Satan came through the back door because you can put a drug in front of me. And I'm like, whatever, you know, I saw what that did, but the relationship, the codependency, the things I saw with my parents, their toxicity that came sneakily through the back door. And that was my addiction. And then he also told me, you know, if you, if you obey and you let go of this one thing that you feel like you can't live without, that's very much killing you. <laughs> I can you like you jump and I'll catch you basically. Mm -hmm. So I, my last resort was to call the shelters. And I was like, I escaped one night and I called the shelter and they were all full, like all of them. And I was like, that was a very low moment. I was like, God, like, this is, this was the first time I was like, you're being cruel. Like you're telling me to get out. The last thing I want to do is a shelter. I don't know what's going to happen. My kids, if I go into a shelter and now they won't, like, I felt like I was so unwanted and nobody, like nobody could take me in, you know, Finally, I had one friend that was like, look, you can stay here for a few weeks, but you're going to have to go after that. Mm -hmm. And so we, we were like, all right. So I was, I took my kids and we were homeless and we went to her house and then we went to hotels and we went to another house, but it was for four months and it was, it was rough. Like we, you know, the kids were having a great time because they were like, oh, we have <laughs> breakfast at the hotel. And, oh, you know, we Wow, like we can, you know, <laughs> hang out with friends if we stay with them. Mm -hmm. And I was like making lunches from a mini freezer that wasn't very cold. I was trying to make sure all their, like I, my car was packed with stuff. And so I was breaking down, but I had to stay strong for them and give them an environment of a normal childhood. And mm -hmm. so um, we finally found this little place in Lutz that we decided to get. And it was a two bedroom trailer. It was very very nasty. And, but it was the only thing that I ever had that was mine and nobody could take that from me. And, and so, um, we moved in and I said, all right, God, you know, like now I have my own place and I need to like figure out work. And, you know, I was substitute teaching, but that wasn't enough. And I knew that the summer was coming and, you know, that they don't do te substitute teaching in the summer. And, so I just really started praying and God led me to go back to school. And so I went to a community college uh, online, got my AA. And then I was like, all right, God, I feel like I want to go for my bachelor's degree. And, you know, he quickened my heart back to when I was a child, my dream was to go to the university of Florida. Like I was a good student. Like I was one of the top in my class and I was supposed to like get these scholarships and I was going to go to UF and I was going to be a businesswoman. I was going to do all these things. And then I had to drop out of high school at 16 and get my GED and start working. I started working at Sunny's barbecue because I had to, number one, I couldn't concentrate in school. I was having panic attacks every day because mm -hmm. of all the instability. And then number two, I needed money because my parents like could barely get like anything I got at that point. It was because I paid for it. You had so, to get it yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So when I started to look up for the bachelor's degree, I was like, all right, well, you know, let me see what I can do. And I found out that UF had an online school. And so I applied and I became, um, they accepted me and I became a gator at my dream at 34 years old. It just yeah. didn't, I didn't, it didn't look what I thought it was going to be. I didn't go to the school itself. Yeah. But, um, when I was 36 years old, I finished my bachelor's. I got to go to Gainesville I had a cabin gown on for the first time. And it was like, when I looked in the mirror, it was like God clothing me in his righteousness because mm -hmm. I had never been in a cabin gown. And, um, another cool thing that happened was they had a call for people that wanted to be a commencement speaker, student commencement speakers. 
And I was like, whatever, I'll apply, you know, cause I, I do public speaking and stuff. And so they called me back and they said, you know, we really want speakers that can attest to being on campus, but your story is so unique that we've never done this. We want to have an online student commencement speaker that can record a video that we can send to all the online students wow. and all the faculty mm-hmm. at you know the online school. And I immediately had one of the higher ups message me and say, thank you so much for sharing your story. I shared it with my daughters because they're around the age that you were when you got into an abusive relationship mm-hmm. and it just touched my heart. And um, they let me have like the VIP section when we got to UF, like I was in, I got to have a dinner where my friends that came and my husband, I got remarried, but I'll talk about that in a second. But my husband got, they got to sit like right over the stage and I could see them when I walked the stage. And, and so, uh, the Dean of the school came to me thinking, man, I'm like crying. I'm like, you're thinking me, like I should be thinking you. And he was like, well, we didn't know the impact that this made. And now we see it with your story. And so it was just, it was like, God did that little extra. It was above and beyond even just graduating. And so I walked the stage first time in my life at 36, got my degree. And, um, also what I said before I got um, through that time of, you know, going back to school and all that, I, I found my now husband who is uh, a good man that treats me well. And, and we have a partnership. It's not like what it used to be. And, and mm-hmm. it's, you know, and he's been a father figure to my boys since he met them, but he legally adopted them just mm-hmm. last year. So now my boys once again, have my same last name and we're all a family, you know, and, mm-hmm. and every time they speak that name, cause they chose that we gave them the choice to get, to have their last name change. They're not only breaking generational curses, but now they're speaking it. Every time they say their new name, they're breaking mm-hmm. that curse of the old And, um, I just started working, doing nonprofit work. I did a lot of, um, fundraising, which is funny because I think back to those moments where I was told no from the shelters, Mm -hmm. it lit a fire in me that I don't want to hear anybody else say no, hurt here. No, you know, so I started fundraising. I did a lot of marketing and, and media and, uh, like, I don't know what are the things like (laughs) graphic design, all that stuff that comes along with marketing. And Mm -hmm. I started doing that for nonprofits and, you know, I knew one day God wanted me to do my own thing. So I, it's funny, I call it from a blog to a brand. I decided, you know, through the time of my own journey, God quickened my heart to make a video diary Mm -hmm. and it started. I mean, there was one day I was abused and I literally just grabbed my camera and I looked at myself in the camera and I said, one day you're going to look back at this and you're going to remember this. Don't ever let somebody do this to you. You know, you deserve better. Like I was speaking Mm -hmm. in that moment to my future self. So when I look back on that now, of course, that's super emotional to see myself after being abused. Mm -hmm. And, um, but in that it gave me this idea that, you know, God had told me, you know, I didn't call you to live in abuse. I called you to live a life abundantly. And so, um, I decided in that moment, like, I want to do a blog where I talk about the day-to-day life after trauma, like the finding myself journey that I went on. Mm -hmm. It is the most beautiful, ugly journey you'll ever go on. There's moments of it that are ugly and you realize things and you, you have to reheal over and over and over. And then there's another part of it that's exciting and fun and beautiful and the best gift you'll ever give yourself. And So I decided to call it the trauma survivor's guide to life abundantly, because that's exactly what it was. Like, how do you go from trauma to the abundant life that God called us to live? Mm -hmm. And as I started to do more nonprofit work, I just felt I started, there was a moment where just the grace was lifted and I just did not feel happy anymore. And I was like, God, this is actually becoming a toxic work environment for me. And, Mm -hmm. you know, there was just things that you see sometimes in that world that, you know, it's hard because your heart is in it for the mission and you see the Mm -hmm. ugly sometimes. And I was like, all right, God, if it's again, if I jump, will you catch me? Because if you're telling me to do this, I'll do this. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm operating in very bold faith right now with starting my own business. And I decided to take it from a blog to a brand because it, it grew, it grew and grew and grew. And and we've been adding things to it. And, you know, I have all these ideas. And, and so for me, it started as a blog and then in it became this thing. 
it's a movement now, you know, it's more mm-hmm. of a creative outlet, not just for me, but for other people to, to yeah. share their stories and to <clears throat> learn about the life after trauma and, and to talk about things that they don't talk about. Like, for instance, I know this is probably TMI, but sex after you've been abused, like, how do you go back when they sexually abused you? How do you, how do you find love again? And then not consistently see red flags because you're so scared if they even do anything that looks like your ex mm-hmm. oh yeah, no I'm done you know and it's that kind of stuff that people don't talk about but we do and it's not just abuse it's all types of trauma even trauma that I haven't been through I've had women that have come on uh, I have a series called survivor empowered where I talk to women who are doing amazing things in business and in their callings in life after trauma And I had, I've had two people come on that had cancer and I've never had cancer. So it was important to me to not just share my journey, but other trauma survivors. Mm -hmm. And so in that too, we're having our first women's conference called the survivor empowered women's conference, where we're going to have speakers who are women that are doing the same things, amazing things after trauma and a mental health panel and a beauty style and health panel and a raffle. And so it's going to be like, you laugh, you cry, all that good stuff. And, you know, I just... God's just really moved our, um, my businesses. I've started another business called a million dreams, creative consulting, where I can help other people that are going through, or I'm sorry, other people that are starting businesses in this world. And, you know, God's given me so many ideas for workshops, you know, how to brand yourself and how to, you know, once you, if you've been through trauma, but you want to be an entrepreneur, like a survivor preneur or whatever you want to call it. Um, it's just been really cool. And to, to be in that business world that I, you know, dreamed of as a kid and to see it come to fruition Mm -hmm. later on in life and to see my children, my sons get to see me do this. And so Mm -hmm. they're seeing me be a bold woman. And when, you know, in a world that, you know, men was not the men in my life were always above me, you know, and now I'm getting to be who God Mm -hmm. called me to be. And so, yeah, it's just been great. I, I do a lot with women in business now you know, God really challenged me because it was super easy to do things for women who were like me, the single moms, the underserved, the people that were going through it, the people that didn't have a lot. And one day God said, you know, you're, you, you feel like your self-worth is beneath these women that have, Mm -hmm. you know, these businesses and they're doing, you know, these things in life. And God said, but they're hurting too, and they can't talk about it. And so that's where, you know, the survivor empowered stuff came along. And so, God is just within, I'm, I'm 38 years old and 38 years and the last five years, because five years ago to this day was when I just moved into the trailer and loot. So in five years, he took me from homeless to remarried to degree to my own businesses, like all this stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, so, you know, it's a testament to God, not me. It's yeah. I, I'm a hot mess without God, but it's a testament to what he can do when you give your full mm-hmm. heart to him and you surrender and mm-hmm. so, um, and, and 38 years though, it, believe me, the days were very long, but the years, if you think about it, it's a long time, but it's not that long, you know, what he's done. And so mm-hmm. I'm just forever grateful. I'll forever speak his name. I'll forever give him glory. And there's just, you know, you can't tell me he's not real after, you know, everything <laughs> you've gone through. Right. I just, he's the only constant I've ever had in my life. The only thing that hasn't left or hurt me or, you know, mm-hmm. so I just have, how do I not speak on him? You know, mm-hmm. but yeah, that's my story. <laughs> that's a lot. Oh my gosh. So, um, I want to ask you too, like, um, this is crazy. I'm trying to word this right. So I, how you're speaking, you know, you've been around 38 years and as long as that is, and you say it hasn't been that long, do you, what it seems like is that, um, so many years of hurt, um, it's almost as if the small amount of years of amazing, God's amazing work overpowered all that stuff. Yeah. Right. And I also, you know, I hurt now I go through things now, you know, I, I, I try to always share with what I do, the present monies, I call them the Mm -hmm. things I still struggle with, the things I still go through, you know, one of those is chronic illness, which, Mm -hmm. you know, we share that. And I, I chronicle my journey in that. Um, there are days that I, because of the trauma I've went through because of, you know, just getting older, I have gone through some health stuff that, 
it, it's can be debilitating at times and it's super frustrating because you just want your body to agree with your mind your mind wants to go but your body won't and so um you know i try to always share that in that just because things are getting better doesn't mean that you're not going to go through trials but what happens is is that you're able to go through them with the experience that you've learned from the past so you know that Hey, I'm going to make it through this. Somebody told me once it was a, a therapist when I, a long time ago told me once, like you can do difficult things. And I was like, that's like so profound, even though it's so like simple. She was like, if the worst thing in the world that you could think of ever happened, you're going to be okay. And you can do difficult things. And so I've just kept that with me. You know, I can, I can make it through another, like what's another trial. And at this point, like mm. <laughs> what else, you know? <laughs> and, uh, so yeah, I try to keep my mind focused on the good, but yeah, there's, there's days that I am not like, you know, singing at the rooftops. How yeah. Great life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Even, even, even when you look at these people that have, you know, there are people I've seen them that they, they don't deal with a lot. They don't have many trials. They have a, life is pretty smooth and even they have stuff. And then you have people that deal with a lot that, I just can never figure out that's the question I'm like god like you never know why it sometimes it's our choices sometimes it's just what is happening um it doesn't matter you know some people follow the lord very closely and love him dearly and repent daily and they deal with a lot of things and there's people who are away from the lord and do a lot of things that are not in align with him and have a wonderful life and the point I'm making is if you're hearing this, like my heart is for Jesus and I don't care what kind of life I have. If I'm walking with my savior, it's the best place to be. I don't care what is going on. Like what, you know, Oh, Sally looks like she's doing great, but she's sinning away and doing all these things that don't align with the Lord. I rather live a life of Christ and walking in that direction whether I have trials or not, or I'm not going to, we don't need to be comparing ourselves to those people because um, a lot of people think like, you know, oh, you know, the Lord did this to you or crazy things, crazy yeah. things because of things we've been through. And um, I know people that deal with things that um, some people think like, oh, you know, it's from your sin or it's from this and that. And the Lord is not a torture or punisher like that. And, um, if you're listening in, I pray that you are feeling encouraged and inspired by Dana's story and her life. And that you see that the goodness of God in that, in that God is amazing and can turn around anything, anything, like anything, anything and everything you could ever imagine. So if you are feeling like you're at your last, um, you know, the end of the string and you're like, I don't know what I can do. Just start saying Jesus and, and, and reach out to the Lord and say his name and invite him into your life. And if you are with him and you feel like he's not listening to you, he is there. And there are times of quietness that you wonder, where are you? And the second you think he's gone, he's right there and he will speak to you. So, um, this was so encouraging and so inspiring. Um, your story is amazing. And I wanted to um, have you tell everyone with, cause I did notice this on your Instagram. So on her Instagram, it's Dana, D-A-N-A Rutherford, R-U-T-H-E-R-F-O-R-D. Um, but it did say the trauma, the trauma survivor's guide to life abundantly. So when you say we talk, is this where they can go to your Instagram, click a link and is it like a, a program or is it um, a lives or what, how are you communicating? Is it video or what is that? Yeah, so my Instagram is at Dana Lynn Rutherford. So D-A-N-A-L-Y-N-N -N, and then Rutherford, R-U-T-H-E-R-F-O-R-D. I know that's long. Um, so in that, I mean, and then I have my website, www.traumasurvivorsguide.com. So we do a lot, um, of videos and things through that, uh, on my website, we have some blogs, we have our survivor empowered women series that I put out through Instagram and Facebook. So we do have a Facebook page, not only my personal page, but we have one for the trauma survivors guide 
to life abundantly. I started a group, a private group on there as well. So people can go in there and share. Um, but we, what I do is I share content on social media and people often are talking in that. And I always answer messages. You know, if people message me, I, I try my best to have an answer. I try to give people resources. I don't necessarily deal in the crisis as much, but if you have a crisis and you reach out to me, I'll try to get you a resource at least. Um, but yeah, we, we do a lot of, uh, content creation, but we're also doing events. We're getting more into that. And so mm -hmm. I know that God is really positioning my heart to do more events, mm -hmm. to have more conferences, to start doing workshops. So the workshops can be a little more interactive and, um, but that the workshops will most likely be through my, a million dreams, creative mm -hmm. consulting, but still it's, you'll see them cross posted and things like that in person and person. Um, I, I want to do virtual too, because I feel okay. like in a busy world and especially mm -hmm. in a, like where people live all over the place, yeah. have the opportunity to have virtual, um, even some that are pre-recorded so that they can do it at their own pace. I am considering doing some webinars where they're mm -hmm. in person or not. In, well, I guess sub in person in this area, but, uh, in the Tampa Bay area, but also through uh, zoom or something like that. So yeah, we, there's various ways. I feel like nowadays there's so many ways to communicate. So you can go through many, many chapters. Mm -hmm. I also do. Um, so I do affiliate marketing where I, uh, get items sent to me and I do videos for them. So you'll see a lot of that on my Instagram too. And you're gonna be like, well, that's not about trauma, but realistically it is because, you know, God really quickened my heart with that stuff too. It's like, I, you know, I am a girl. I, well, I'm a woman, but mm -hmm. I, I like girly things. And I, you know, I feel like for so long, I felt like I didn't deserve things. And, and, you know, part of this journey of trauma surviving, like the life abundantly is that, you know, you start to think of like, what can I do to feel better and look better? Mm -hmm. You know, how can I have these things that I love? And it's not about the things in a materialistic way, but it's, I deserve these things. And so it's been a really cool experience to be able to actually like, uh, get things sent to me. I actually can make money off of that stuff too. And so it's a way to help my family while God has blessed me to be able to yeah. do that. So I know it sounds silly, but you know, me putting a, myself in an outfit is actually my form of healing from trauma. So Things yeah. like that. I try to have all avenues because some people are not wanting to hear all the deep stuff. They want to see the fluffy stuff. Well, mm -hmm. I don't blame you at all. If you want to see fluffy stuff and here you go, here it is. And so we just try to have all, I say we, because it's my husband's a part of it too. And it's just, I feel like my, everything I do, I feel like my family is collaborative. And I, so I always say we, but what I try to do on my social media is have all types of like what trauma is. And it's going to be different than what you've seen because our slogan for the trauma survivors guide is rebranding the trauma survivor, because it's our hope that through advocacy, through education, through events, through all this stuff we do, that if people can see a trauma survivor as a good thing, as somebody that's overcome, mm -hmm. that maybe it'll help somebody on their own journey. Because right now, when you Google trauma survivor, all the images are gloom and doom. Yeah. So it's easy to say, well, that's what I am, you know, and suddenly 20 years later, you're still talking about your trauma. Like it just happened mm -hmm. when I want to say, Hey, I acknowledge my trauma. I still hurt at times, but I can live an abundant life after it. And so, um, that's, that's all it's about. We try to show that and uh, we try to be an avenue for that. That's awesome. Well, I do want to tell everyone how I found you. So on Instagram, you came up because you were sitting in front of your camera and you were putting on makeup and there was this video you did and you're like, you had all this makeup out. You're like, let's do my makeup. And you're like, let's talk daddy issues. And so you're talking and like, by the time your makeup was done, I felt like I had like a, a lesson or I felt seen or something. It's, it, it, I was amazed. I'm like, this is incredible. This is incredible. It was amazing. It's like, it was, it was really good. So, um, if you basically, if you're, um, a woman and you're alive, you can relate to her <laughs> in any way, you're a mom, a sister, a girl, a daughter, whatever you are, whether you're a Christian and not a Christian, it doesn't matter. Like she has so much to offer. And, um, I feel like you could get a lot from her. I feel like if there's anyone that, you know, that, um, 
needs like support in any way, just going to her Instagram and just following the things that she does. There's, there's so many things that are positive, um, life giving and, um, any, anything from lipstick to trauma is on there. And, um, faith and family and all of that. And just her story in general is just so encouraging, so inspiring and um, just everything about it. I feel like you can get so much from it. So please follow her. I'm going to put all the links to her at the end. And I want to thank you for joining us and hearing her out and um, God bless you all. Bye. Bye.